Welcome to Pseudopod Towers. Get comfy. Find a cushion to hide behind. You're going to need it. Pseudopod, episode 616, October 12th, 2018. This week's stories, Flash on the Borderlands, XLIV, Objectification. Hey everyone, welcome to Pseudopod, the weekly horror podcast. I'm Alistair, your host, and this week we're talking about objectification. What do you see? What do you think you see? The gap between them is invisible and massive, and almost all modern life lives there. It's why people don't make eye contact with the homeless. It's why pickpockets can lift your wallet with impunity. It's why stop and search in the UK is eight times more likely to target persons of colour. We look. We don't always see. But, like a well-known movie scientist once said, you have to look with better eyes than that. Or in this case, listen with better ears. Oh, before we dive in, content warning folks. This one is very strong territory. And first off, we have The Stripper by Heather Thomas. The Stripper is a pseudopod original and is read by Nika Harper, whose recent reading on Cast of Wonders is also extraordinarily good, and I cannot recommend highly enough. So get ready, because here comes the first true story. The Stripper, by Heather N. Thomas, narrated by Nika Harper. She was living in squalor. At least that's what her friends had said, and now she never saw them anymore. Their looks of disapproval with undertones of disgust were displaced, undeserved. It was bullshit. She'd let some things go. Her apartment certainly needed a clearing of clutter and a good bleaching to get rid of the smell. Empty boxes and rancid food containers piled up along each wall. She couldn't remember the last time she'd taken out the garbage. She couldn't be bothered. The place had been a shithole long before she signed the lease. The pale blue glow of her computer screen was the only source of light. Her shuttered windows, covered by thick black curtains, blocked out the rest of the world. Her time was consumed with packages. So many packages. All she had to do was point, click, and they'd be taken away. This had all started with her panties. A friend had once mentioned that she knew of girls who sold theirs for serious money. The idea was so absurd and degrading that they just laughed it off. Later, her curiosity got the best of her, and she searched online. Turns out lots of women did this, and they were making serious money indeed. After she had sold about a dozen pair... The messages poured in. Hey, baby, you look so sexy in those little panties. Do you have anything else to sell? At first, she was afraid to ask exactly what they were thinking. But again, her curiosity won. Thanks, cutie. What are you looking for? The requests ranged from the mundane to the bizarre to the downright vile. These men disgusted her. But Jesus, the money was too good. After she had sold most of her clothes, it wasn't long before she was scouring through trash cans to fulfill the orders. Kleenex, sanitary napkins, Q-tips, hair shavings, nail clippings, piss, shit, they wanted all of it. Piece by piece, she shipped herself all over the world. The more she sold, the more sickening the orders became. She satisfied every one. She'd often promised herself that she would stop. 
Her closets and drawers were bare. Her fingers were bloodied from overclipping. She was nearly bald. She'd covered every mirror in her apartment, unable to stand the sight of the pallid, hairless thing that stared back at her. It had to stop. One morning, she received a message with the subject of, How much? You have the most elegant white thighs. I'd like to eat your skin. How much for just a small strip of it? Regards, James M. She read over this several times, becoming more nauseated with each scan of the words. She ran to the bathroom, vomited into a Ziploc bag. She stumbled into her kitchen. Her pale, bony hand slid a paring knife from the block. She stared at it for an endless moment. She sat down at her kitchen table and began to cut. There's still a perception with horror that it's the lesser sibling of the genre trifecta or quad factor, if you want to include crime, quin factor if you want to include romance. Horror is the sensationalist one. It's the one where you just get to shoot monsters and women fall over and die immediately after having sex. Giant crabs are in horror. Horror is the home of the lamp monster. Horror doesn't matter. That's the accepted wisdom. That's how the genre is objectified. Horror matters. Horror matters as much, if not more, than other genres, because horror at times like this is real. Oh, sure, this isn't happening. Not publicly. But if there's one thing humanity can be trusted to do, is walk right up to the edge of destruction, personal and or cultural, and start shaving it down and selling it off for souvenirs. And I'm not getting at the lead here, not at all. You want an example of a horror heroine? You have one right here, and it's a fantastic narration, too. Now, the horror here is nothing to do with her, it's to do with the fact she finds a market. The horror here is that it's a boom market. The horror here is that there are no limits to what people consume, and painfully mortal, painfully small limits to what we can allow to be consumed of ourselves and live. And most of all, the horror is that once the lead here is gone, her clients will simply move on to someone else. as we must now move on to I Am Your Dog by Jen C. A. Morris. Jen would like to promote the Lions Foundation of Canada Dog Guides program, as her son is in the process of getting a match from there. If anyone would like to donate, they can be found at dogguides.com. Of course, the link will be in the show notes. I Am Your Dog is a pseudopod original, and when we asked Jen about the inspiration for the story, here's what they said. My inspiration for this happened after I'd been alone at the office for a long, slow day. After visiting the restroom, I suddenly had a horrid image of someone coming into an empty washroom after a woman had finished using it. I'd say more, but it might spoil the story. After that, the piece wrote itself. Your reader for this story is Austin Malone. Austin Malone is not actually a dog, but is somewhat bitey. When not patrolling the slush dungeons below Pseudopod Towers, he can be found at his website, sippinghemlocktea.com. And so... Once more, buckle up, because here's our second true story. I Am Your Dog by Jen C.A. Morris Narrated by Austin Malone You are really pretty. You are really smart. You smell really nice. My favorite is at the end of the day when you walk by in your shoes, sweaty, girl sweat, so nice. Smile at me. I say hello and wave. I, I am sad when you go, but I know you will come back tomorrow. I know these things because... I am your dog. One day, you didn't come in for your cigarettes. You were supposed to do that. I waited, but you didn't come. I was so sad, and my head was so red. On break, I peed some places. 
Then I felt better. My boss was mad, though, said, Don't throw a weirdo fit again, or I'll call your parole officer. I thought, It's okay. You will come back tomorrow. I just need to wait nicely. I know these things because I am your dog. The best, best thing happened the day you came into the store and said your office bathroom was broke, asked nice to use. Boss said okay. Then you left. You flushed. Too bad. I still licked the bowl. Maybe can taste you. It's okay because I am your dog. Dogs do that stuff all the time. You walked by my work. I tried to wave. You waved back, but didn't come in. So I ran up to you and jumped a bit, so excited. I said, don't you want your cigarettes? You were so surprised. Stepped back, said, N not today. I quit, and smiled. Nice smile. Then a car came, picked you up. A man in the car. He kissed you. He kissed you. I growled and growled. You drove away, not looking. Look at me. Look at me. My boss grabbed me, but I am your dog, so I bit him. A lot. Gotta be stray now. I would be sad, but I know it's just until I find you. Then we will be fine. I'll keep you safe, warm, satisfied, because I am your dog. At school, I learned you use a phone book to find where people live. I knew your name because it is on the sign at your work. It is a weird name. I wrote it down. W wait Dogs don't do this. Dogs don't. I just need to find you. Just that one people thing. Then I can go back to being your dog all the time. Two names in phone book. First one, open the door. I am sorry. Was so excited. Ran in. There was someone. Old lady. I broke her hip. Humping. She was screaming real loud. I'm sorry. Can't help it. Wrong house. Not her dog. Just visiting. I find your house. Waited. Saw you go inside from the bushes. <laughs> Hooray! I scritch, scratch on the door. I see in movies when nice ladies open the door. They see a puppy all alone and they let them come in because they are nice. You are a nice lady, right? And I am your dog. So much of my personal critical journey through horror fiction this year has been an understanding of the limits of perception, and for me, this piece embodies those limits. There are two horror stories happening at the same time here. I know one of them intimately, and that's the invisibility of retail staff. Not even simple invisibility, but active discrimination and exploitation. The fact that as time goes on, these are among the people who are relied on the most and given the least. Zero hour contracts, minimal pay, and somehow you're still expected to know everything about everything. I have friends, good friends I might add, who during my time running a comic store would often joke when they saw me out socially that I had legs. They just assumed I ran on a caster behind the counter and was turned off when the lights were turned off. It's a lonely place, retail, a lot of the time. I'm glad I'm not there anymore, because if you stay there long enough, you can internalize that discrimination. You can believe you get turned off with the lights at the end of the day. And sometimes, if that happens, that opens the door to the rest of this story. The resentment, the internalization of self-hatred, and worst of all, the individual character's personal damage becoming wrapped around a survival strategy that is, in the end, literally and metaphorically, nothing more than a feral dog chasing cars with no idea what to do once they've got them, and no ability to comprehend the damage they're doing. Terrifying in its un mundanity, and how that mundanity is broken. And an unforgettable piece of flesh. Thank you both. And that brings us to our third and final true story for you this week. The House of Jack's Girls by Lee Battersby is, once again, a pseudopod original, and is brought to you by a very good friend of mine, Chloe Yates is a fantastic author in her own right, and a phenomenal narrator. 
So, with Lee's words and Chloe's voice, one more time, one more true story. The House of Jack's Girls by Lee Battersby Narrated by Chloe Yates The waiting room is full of terrified boys. Their fathers bring them. For most of them, it's their first time. Boys without even a razor rash, stinking of pomade and sweat, here to face the horror of a woman. Madame is on form tonight. She's a gentle introduction to the evening's festivities, urbane, charming and cajoling, as long as your money is good and you approach her with respect. I've seen men run screaming from her, their pants soaked with piss and eyes rolled back in their sockets. But there's none of that tonight, not in front of these boys who barely lift their eyes from shyness. Tonight she is all smiles and gentle words. Her message is clear. You are too young, too callow to satisfy me. But you will get a taste of the future tonight, a taste of what may come to be. You are a shadow of your father, as my girls are a shadow of me, and they are all that you deserve. She is intriguing, infatuating, a glimpse of the unfettered sensation to come. The boys can barely resist the urge to run. We peek at them through the curtains strung between the receiving room and our quarters, giggling at the boys' nervousness and pointing out choice specimens. Once everyone is as comfortable as possible, Madame will lead us out in ones and twos to wander amongst the clients and see who responds to our charms. The boys choose us, never the other way around. It's been that way since the dawn of time. Men always select their women. Some of these men were here when they were young, brought unwilling by their fathers, who were brought by their fathers in turn. Some families have been coming for generations, and each has their favourite. Half the youngsters in the room pick their girls before they even walk through the door, wooed by family tradition and the stories of their elders. Still, there are conventions and rituals to be followed. We are civilised people in a civilised trade. We must observe the formalities. As if on cue... Madame raises her head and beckons the first of us forward. Martha is an easy introduction, tall and restrained with only a modicum of indecency about her. She attracts the mildest of clientele, those who wish the thrill of contact without fully exploring the depths of their fascination. I see most of the boys visibly relax. Perhaps their emotions are not as sophisticated as older men, or perhaps I have been here so long that even their responses are ritualised. Either way, their thoughts are obvious. Perhaps this will not be so bad. Perhaps I'll get through this just fine, become a man at last, an equal in my father's eyes. I can do this. I can do this. Several boys shift in their chairs, straightening spines and doing their best to greet Martha's chat with what they hope is sufficient wittiness and maturity. An equal number begin to move, only to be restrained by a fatherly hand on their shoulder. Ambitious men, men of importance in the city outside these walls, they know better. They know what prizes come to a boy who quells his impatience and tastes the treats available further down the table. Martha has it easy enough. Within minutes, a nervous, mousy father has matched her with his equally nondescript offspring. The rest of us dissolve into the shadows as she brings him back through the curtain and down the hallway to her room. Then it is the turn of the next girl, and the next. Slowly, the ranks of the uninitiated are winnowed. Slowly, the girls who are chosen become more exotic, more to the taste of the hard-faced fathers in expensive suits and positions of power who remain. In under an hour, we are down to five. These are the men who matter, the ones who sit in the highest positions of power. These are the men who have learned just how far they are willing to go in order to sit in the thrones in the shadows of London and make the city dance to the strings they pull. 
They had their first lessons here, at the command of their fathers and the bodies of my companions and me. They sit still and quiet now, waiting, with their sons still and quiet next to them. Mary Ann is first, as it was back in the day, as it has always been. A boy is quiet as she approaches. He stands before she arrives, moves forward and takes her hand. It is an awkward movement, clearly rehearsed at the behest of the man at his back. His father performed the same uncomfortable act of fake gallantry as did his father. The longer we are here, and I fear we will be here forever, the more things begin to blur. After Mary, it is Annie's turn, and after her is Long Liz. Each one is a taste more refined than the last, a story more entrenched in London's bloody history. Each one represents a greater distillation of the city's power, its hatred and violence and repression. Each one is a token to be possessed, earning her own entrance into the alleyways of true power. We melt into the darkness of the corridor and allow each boy to pass without seeing us as we truly are. And in doing so, pass our power and ownership into his possession. Then two boys remain. Two fathers sit by their side, men of steel and concrete and unforgiving history. Catherine steps through the curtain. She was never beautiful, Catherine, but what Jack did to her changed her in ways that only the most particular of tastes would desire. Her face is barely a face, her throat nothing more than a ragged hole where flesh once hung. Where her belly sat, full and gassy, a bloody cavern drips and shows glimpses of dark organs. Some men like it. Some men use it. One of the boys stiffens. His father whispers harsh words. I wonder if he was one of those men, and what acts have been murmured on nights when men of his family have gathered. Then Catherine is back, her young beau walking stiffly beside her. There is only one white-faced boy left, and he is mine. One hundred and fifty women are killed in London every year. Not all of them are prozies, but some and not all of them find their way here, but some. Not all who become restless are people. Places can be murdered too. Buildings can die with their task on earth unfulfilled and become a spirit trapped in time and purpose. And just as prozies are more likely to suffer abuse and assault and murder at the hand of a bloody man, so are brothels. So we find each other and haunt the living, and try to find a way to live with the world that destroyed us, but will not let us go. And of all the prozies who have died over the centuries, none are as famous as we unhappy five. Jack's women. Jack's trolls. Dead as we are, mutilated and destroyed and trapped by our fame. There will always be men who desire us, who will pay to touch us, and possess us and smear their skin with our ever-flowing blood. Men who know about this place and come to taste what they dare not want in the living world. My name is Mary Jane, who sometimes called herself Marie Jeanette, and what was done to me was beyond the understanding of all women and only most men. When I come through the curtain and accept the hand of the only boy left in the room, I look into the eyes of his father, who once was a boy who came to me and possessed me, and know that he is not most men. His son will, after this night, be forever a member of that small fraternity that understands where such things are done and will bring his own son to me, in turn. I take him down the quiet corridor alone, shut the door of my room against the judgment of the world. The boy is almost in tears. I drop my dress and let him drink in my devastated flesh. Now he does cry, helpless, weak tears of disgust and desire and sacrifice. I take the back of his head in my hand. I have no breasts, 
Jack put one beneath my head and one between my feet. I pull the boy's face into the raw meat of my ruined chest. I feel him sob and whimper and gasp short, terrified breaths. Then slowly, infinitely slowly, with a trembling fear that would break my heart had Jack not ripped it from my chest and burned it in the fire. I feel his lips and his tongue and his fingers begin to explore. A city is a map of scars. London has more scars than most, but none leave more of a telling visible mark than the Jack the Ripper murders, and none tell us more about horror and how we view it. We sell the dead. We do it all over the world and in every medium, but it's in London, Edinburgh, York, where the dead are commoditized. We walk their graves, we reenact their final moments. We sell and tell their stories for a few pounds a time. And on the good days, and most of them are good days, that's keeping their memories alive. After all, you die twice. Once when you die, and once when a ghost tour stops telling your story. But then, there are the bad days. There's a need here, for me, as always, to find hope. That the ritual is intended to show how bad the city can be. That these men of power are going to be the ones to break the cycle of class system riddled snobbery and sociopathy that has maimed the city and the country beyond recognition for centuries. That the message here is simple. We bled so you know that others shouldn't. We bled so that you know that we shouldn't either. But these men have been here before, and so have their fathers, and where we see women, they see meat. Where we see the consequences of horror, they see harmless banter, locker room talk, drinking games that are fun until they aren't, and what does it matter? There's always another doxy. The phrase, it's just a whore, is disgusting by itself. The fact that what they're really saying is it's just a woman is worse. A city is a map of scars. Learning to trace them, learning their origin is brave. Embodying those scars, becoming the trauma that killed you, is as self-destructive as it is selfless. Vowing to never inflict that trauma on others, that's heroic. I hope there are heroes in that room. I have my doubts. Pseudopod relies on you to do three things. Well, four. The first is listen, and thank you for that. The other three are support us. And two of those involve money. And I'm a Brit and we hate money, so I'm talking about it. So let's just get those out of the way first. Uh, you can subscribe for as little as five bucks a month through either PayPal or Patreon. That gets you access to the uh, premium content bucket, which is a veritable bucket and is crammed full of amazing things, with more added basically every month. The other option is for Patreon, you could subscribe at higher levels, which gets you not so much more premium content, but more access, more behind the scenes looks at what we do and how we do it, that kind of thing. There's some really fun levels over there. So do pop along and take a look. And if you can, please back us up on either one. Oh, you can donate through PayPal as well. That's as much or as little as you want. And that's a one-off payment. Alternatively, if you can't manage to donate financially, we totally get it. Times are hard. You can donate signal boosting you can donate attention leave a review on google or itunes blog about an episode that you liked tweet a link to an episode you liked do you have a podcast yourself could you use a guest get in touch we'll hook you up with the right member of our staff for what you want to talk about if you want to interview us if you want to talk about the shows or genre podcasting or the things that we do and how we do them please get in touch we do genuinely love doing this kind of thing and hopefully it comes across so yeah signal boosting or just straight up money really either works 
both work even better and anything you can do is very very gratefully appreciated we'll be back next week but before then we as ever will be a production of escape artist incorporated and released under a creative commons attribution non-commercial no derivatives license and i leave you with this quote from from hell Below the skin of history are London's veins. These symbols, the mitre, the pentacle star, even someone as ignorant and degenerate as you can sense that they course with energy and meaning. I am that meaning. I am that energy. See you next week, folks. It's a pseudopod. It's a big foot. It's all about podcasts these days.